I keep a journal. I've had this journal for more than 25 years. I use this journal to record my thoughts and feelings on the most exceptional days of my life. Monday, October 16th, 1995, was the best day of my life. That was the day of the Million Man March. I was 35 years old, living in Richmond, and there I was in D.C. standing shoulder to shoulder with a million black men. And we were challenged that day to hold our heads up, defy the often debilitating negative stereotypes about black men, hold on to our faith, and go back home and make a commitment to yourself and your family to be positive and energetic and help your community thrive. One of the most searing images for that day for me is when we were asked, all of us, to take a dollar bill out of our pockets and hold it up in the air, waving it as a symbol of the economic impact we would have if we all worked in tandem. As a result of that day, I came, I decided, you know, I'm going to change my life. I had clarity on how to change my life. I left D.C., stopped becoming a, being a lawyer, turned into a humanitarian sector leader here in town. And over those years here in Richmond, I got to learn a lot about social service programs, and something became pretty obvious to me. A lot of the people who were served by the agencies were black, but the donors were not. About 2009, I'm at a barber shop downtown, Second and Marshall. I'm getting my hair cut. I had hair back then. <laughs> And the barber, who was a stranger to me, said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I told him what I did. And he went, man, I, I feel wounded. I feel wounded every time I look at the TV and I see the news and I see these images of, of black men who are victims or perpetrators of crime. And I said, I do too. And he said, we need to talk. We don't talk about this. And he had an epiphany. He went, I own this barber shop. I am going to one night a month, open up the shop for brothers to come in and talk about these kinds of things. And he did, and I was there. We talked about all kinds of topics, from religion to economics, everything except sports. <laughs> the, the, the talks were cathartic and emotional and moving. I had Million Man March, March flashbacks at those talks. Here's an example of the kind of dialogue. One guy said, um, fellas, I need some advice. And the, it was standing room only some, some months. I just dropped my girlfriend off at the airport. She's gone on a business trip. I have the keys to her car, the keys to her apartment. And after this talk tonight, I'm planning to get another woman and take her back to my girlfriend's place. Is that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but we, there was a pause, and tears welled up in his eyes. And so we said, yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> but what was going on is we had a safe environment. That sanctuary the barbershop allowed all of us to take off our mask and open our hearts and free our minds. So for some of us, we broke away and decided to work on the need for more black men to be <coughs> philanthropists. And we started doing research on black philanthropy. And we found that it was not a new concept. Black people have always helped each other by giving money, but it's been informal. It's been unofficial. Family members helping family members. Church members helping church members. And we thought, wow, this is something that's important. And we even found out that a long time ago, black men formed giving circles, which were called beneficial societies. We also realized that here in our community lived a man named Thomas Cannon. He lived from um, 1926 to 2005. Thomas Cannon gave away $155,000 on a salary of no more than $30,000. What he would do would read the newspaper and see stories about people in trouble or people who he wanted to support, and he would write a check for $1,000 and send it to that person. Meanwhile, he lived way below his means, so much so that people pitied his living circumstances, but to him, his worth, his value was giving money to strangers to encourage them. So with our history of giving plus the inspiration of our local hero, Thomas Cannon, we decided we can do that. We can find several brothers in this town to pool our resources together to, to give to people in need or give to agencies in need. And we did that. 
we thought of a name for the organization, and we said Ujima, the Ujima Legacy Fund. Ujima is the third day of Kwanzaa, which means collective work and responsibility. And we found a wonderful partner in the Community Foundation. We found 20 men who willingly stepped forward and said, I believe in that, I connect with that. And we all gave $1,100 in homage to Thomas Cannon to pool our resources together. Last year, our first year, we gave $20,000 to Partnership for the Future. And this year, thanks. <laughs> this year, we're on our way. We're about to enter our second grant cycle, and there are even more men. I have no doubt that as we continue to grow and swell in our numbers, our impact will increase exponentially. And we all feel in our heart when we present a check to an agency that's serving young black boys, we want them to see us. And we want them to feel, when I grow up, I want to be a philanthropist too. The resurgence of black philanthropy, the birth of the Ujima Legacy Fund, an exceptional time in my life. I'm writing about it in my journal. Thank you. <laughs>